Hvala, da ste se zvali na dan v takem številu, da ste prišli poslušati predavanje od profesora Marka Aronofa. Se govori o zelo zanimivi temi, o bistvu vezani na evolucijo etika, ki načeljamo vse zanima. So, yeah, Mark Aronoff, who is presenting here today, is a professor of linguistics in Stony Brook University. He's actually the sort of the founder of the linguistic department in, the Stony, in Stony Brook University. He came there in 1974, right after graduation in MIT, and has been there since. He had many visiting positions in various universities, like <laughs> New York University, etc. And he had, I mean, his most famous thing, he's most famous for, or he is considered as one of the fathers of modern morphology, uh, all coming out of his sort of important PhD dissertation from MIT in 1974. Uh, he has done lots of important work afterwards also, so it's not just the past glory that he's famous for. Uh, lately, he's been working on the sign language in Israel, the Bedouin language, which he looks explain why it's important and interesting. But um, other than that, yeah, thank you for coming. Please. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so first, uh, let me thank everybody for coming. I, I know that tomorrow is a holiday. And so uh, I'm especially pleased that people were able to come out here tonight to this beautiful place. Uh, I want to thank the president of the university for, for coming here. Even physicists can learn something about language. Um, and I want to uh, especially uh, thank, uh, first of all, my colleagues, Professor Harris from Stony Brook and my former student, Shu, who came all the way from Singapore uh, just to listen to me. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and most especially to, uh, to thank Lanko. Um, ever since he came back here to uh, Nova Gorica uh, a couple of years ago, we've been discussing uh, about me coming for, uh, for a visit. And uh, so uh, I hope that this will be uh, the first of, uh, of many visits that I, uh, that I make here to, uh, to Nova Gorica and to Lanco. So I'm going to talk today about um, a, uh, what we call an emerging language. And I'll tell you a little bit about this language, and then I am going to tell you about why this language is important. And in fact, it's, uh, it's quite a unique language. So this language is called Isayad Bedouin Sign Language. Um, this language is in its third generation, and I'll explain to you what it means for the language to be in its third generation. All of the members of the first generation are deceased, so we never had any contact with them. And it is used by about 125 deaf people in this village, and by many hearing people in the village. And one of the most striking things is when you come into this village, uh, you're always surrounded by young children. There are many children in the village, and the children are always busy signing. And in fact, it's impossible to tell which of the children who are signing are deaf and which of the children are hearing, because uh, everybody, not everybody, but many, many people in this village use this sign language, which is quite unusual. Uh, I know in, in, in most places in the world, deaf people are kind of isolated from the hearing people, but that's not what happens in this village. When, in fact, the language, as we say, is the second language of the village after Arabic. Um, we call this language Esayed Bedouin Sign Language. It's in the village of Esayed, which is in the Negev, the Negev Desert in Israel, uh, near Beersheba, which is the big town in the Negev Desert. It's what we call socially isolated. So geographically, it's not isolated. In fact, there's a McDonald's maybe two kilometers from there. Um, but uh, it's socially very isolated because these people don't really mix with other people. They don't mix with other Bedouins either. They just, they've been, they keep to themselves. They've lived in this place about 200 years um, in, the same, in the same village. 
Okay, I'm going to show you actually a bit of conversation. These are two young women who are using this language and um, the, this woman over here is somebody we work with a lot. She's, uh, she's about 25 years old now. She's the youngest member of the second generation of uh, signers. Uh, this is her cousin who is actually from the next generation, but they're not very far apart. I show you this video because people, when they hear about this language, they say, well, if people invented a language 75 years ago, they can't really, it must be that they can't really express themselves in this language. And that's why I show the video, to give you an idea that for these people, this is their language, they don't know any other language, and they can say everything they want in this language. They have no trouble at all expressing themselves. Okay. Um, question, who are these people? Well, the first deaf people were born in the fifth generation of the village. So the village was founded about 200 years ago, and about 75 years ago, there were eight deaf people born in the village. Um, and uh, the second generation, as the people that we mostly work with, are from about 25 to 45. And then there's the third generation, which are much more numerous. There's actually even now a fourth generation of very young children, though we can't tell yet whether these people are dead. All right, the language. This is what is most interesting about the language. The, this language arose, as we say, spontaneously. So as far as we can tell, and we have studied this very carefully, there was no outside influence on this language. It was simply that there were eight deaf people in the village, and they just created the language by themselves. And that's what is interesting about the language, because if you have a language that is created in complete isolation without any outside influence, that might give you some clues as to what are the, the very, very basic properties of language. Some of you may have heard the story of the Egyptian pharaoh Sametikos, who is described in um, uh, Herodotus. So the Greek historian Herodotus wrote about this Egyptian pharaoh that he wanted to know what the first language was. And so he took two children and he put them on an island by themselves with a deaf shepherd and some sheep. And the idea was to see what would happen to, to, when those children started to speak. And the story that Herodotus tells is that the first word that the children spoke was bekos. And that they went and asked scholars, and the scholar said bekos is the Phrygian word. Therefore, it must be that Phrygian was the original language. My theory is that they were listening to the sheep, and the sheep were going bah, 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 and that was why they said it. But so you can't take hearing people and do this to them. It's not permissible ethically. But with deaf people, this actually happens quite frequently that they create a language. All right, who are these people? As I said, there are about 135 deaf people in this village. They are, as we say, in, they show profound early, early neurosensory hearing loss at all frequencies. What that means is that these people are born completely deaf from birth. They cannot hear anything from birth. They are otherwise completely normal. So their intelligence is normal, they have no physical problems. The only problem is that they are completely deaf. We actually know exactly what the genetic reason is for this deafness. Uh, it has to do with a particular spot on a particular chromosome that is broken, and it's what, it is recessive, so it means that this deafness just sort of pops up in the community. You can't tell who's going to be deaf and who is not going to be deaf. There is a very high percentage of deaf people so, as you can see, it's many, many times the normal percentage of deaf people. 
As I said, deaf people are completely integrated in this community. They're not considered to be, um, there's nothing considered to be wrong with them. All the deaf people get married. In fact, I think people prefer to have a deaf husband or wife. Um, but um, certainly all of the deaf adults we know in the community are married, both men and women. So the people in the community do not consider that deafness is, is a fault in any way. And of course, they're exposed to the sign language from birth. This is their, their mother tongue, you might say. All right, as I mentioned, the language is completely sui generis, autochthonous, as we say. Um, I learned that the term autochthonous is used in geology, and it means to re it's used to refer to rocks that didn't come from somewhere else. So that's, this is like a rock that didn't come from somewhere else. And the most interesting thing about the language, which I'll show you, is that it is different from Arabic, and it's different from Hebrew, so it is very clear that the language was not created by the hearing people, because it's completely different in structure from the local language. All right, one question you might ask is, what is this language like? Does it have words, or does it use gestures? And the answer is that it uses a little bit of both, and I'm going to show you a contrast this language with uh, American Sign Language, which is a fully developed language, to show you how the people in this language, they do use more gestures than people in American Sign Language. This also gives me a chance to show one of my favorite movies. Uh, this is an example of how we work. What we do is we show people little clips, little silent movies or, or cartoons. We show them video clips of people doing things. And then we ask them, we put two deaf people, one sort of facing each other, and we ask them to describe to the other person what they see on the screen. And then we have two video cameras uh, that we record what's going on. Um, so come on, Tweety. Whoops, sorry. So you see this is Tweety Bird. Here comes Sylvester. I don't know what you call that. In, in, uh, does Sylvester have a name in Slovenia? Is he Sylvester? No. Yeah, okay. And now he's saying, I taught, I taught a putty tat. Uh, and then, of course, the cat is going to jump. All right, now you're going to see, this is one of the second generation of signers, and you can see how he's going to use his whole body to kind of imitate what he sees. These are my colleagues here. <laughs> this is a American Sign Language, and you see the difference that she's using much smaller individual signs. That's my other colleague, who is deaf. So one of our researchers, Carol Padden, is, is a deaf linguist. And you're going to see the second half of this. You see the cat. The, Jumping. You see the way he points to the table? So he's using everything around him. And again, Carol, you'll see she doesn't do that. Now, that doesn't mean that the language doesn't have words. In fact, it does have words. And one of the most interesting properties of this language is that it has, you have to learn a little linguistics for a minute, it has what we call SOV word order. So S means subject. O means object, and V is verb. So English is what we call an SVO language, subject, verb, object. Is Slovenian SVO? Sort of. Slovenian is more or less SVO. Um, Arabic is SVO. In fact, it's a, that's a very common order. But what happens in this language that is really quite interesting is that the word order is not SVO, it's SOV. Um, all right, I'll get to that in a minute. First, I'm going to show you some actual words in the language. And what I'm going to show you is, I'm going to show you words used by older signers, and then I'm going to show you the same word used by a young child. And you're going to see what happened in the language 
that the old designers, again, are very mimetic. They imitate what they see. The younger signer is just going to be much quicker because she's taking these, these imitations and she's turning them into words. So you can actually see the language kind of, you can see the words emerging in the language in a very, very short time. So here's an older signer and you can see he's, he sees a picture of a tree and he's describing this tree. Right? He's just trying to, there's another. She is actually the tenth deaf person to use this language. So she was from the older, the second generation, but she's one of the older members. Now you're going to see a child. She's a very beautiful child, but watch how, watch how she does tree. It's going to be very quick. That's it. <laughs> you see it? So you saw in the first, in the, the earlier generation, they had very elaborate description of this tree. And she just goes like that. That's her word for tree. So you can see how it, um, how it happens. So you can see the contrast between those mimetic forms that the older people made and this single word, much shorter single word, which is, remember, completely on the hand. So he, you remember he was going like this, like this, and he was pointing to things. He was like being like Marcel Marceau. But the child, that doesn't happen with her. She's just using single individual word signs. Okay, so let me show you about the word order in this language, the SOV word order in the language. And we'll show you how, how we find out what the word order is. So what we do is we make these little video clips of scenes, very small, and then we show them to people and we ask, well, what did you see? And they describe it. And in fact, I have to say, this discovery of the word order, we weren't even looking for it. We did, it wasn't something we were thinking about. And we had recorded these scenes and we were sitting watching the, what we had recorded and we were just, sitting one afternoon and I'm looking at this, the four of us were sitting there, and I'm looking and I'm just say, I suddenly I just say, SOV. And we figured it out that that's what they were doing, was that they had this word order that is completely different from, all right, so everybody sees the picture. Now, you want me to show that again? Because what she's showing is, she's showing man, picture, show. So it's man, right, picture, show. We'll do it again. It's man over there, picture, show. Everybody saw that? Okay, so it's S-O-V. Man over there, picture, show. All right, so just to show you how this works, we collect many, many such utterances. We tape many people doing that, doing different, different scenes. And this is uh, from a paper that we published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, we got a lot of publicity for this paper. We had, had an article in the New York Times. It was very exciting. We were famous for 15 minutes. Uh, we were even in Corriere della Sera. <laughs> I mean, forget the New York Times, right? Uh, and you can see that you can see uh, all of these, the verb is not at the end. All of those there, the verb is at the end. And you can see that not only is the verb always final, but it's S, V, O, V. If you have an S and an O, it's S, O, V. It's not O, S, V uh, or anything other than that. All right? So that shows you what the word order is. And as I said, What's remarkable is, first of all, that the local language is SVO. So they're not being influenced. So it's two things. One is the local language is SVO. What's even more remarkable, but you, we didn't really think about, it, is that they even have subjects, verbs, and objects. I mean, where did they get that, right? I mean, they just, you know, people, the scene, in the scene, there's no subjects, verbs, and objects, but they actually do that. Um, interesting thing, more recently, People have done some experiments 
with hearing people. Hearing people, uh, and they ask, they show them a bunch of pictures, they show them a video, and then they show them like a picture of a man, and then a picture, and, and an action. And it turns out that even if the people speak an SVO language, like English or Slovenian, the, they have a tendency to give you SOV, word order, which maybe indicates that there's something about that word order that, you know, I mean, if you're a strict Chomskyan like Lanko over here, then you might say that, that it's actually wired in the brain, that, that the human brain is somehow, has a pre, predisposed to give you that particular word order, because even people who speak a language that works differently, if you change them to make them sign, they will give you SOV. Okay, it's actually the same fact, just compressed. All right, an interesting point is that even if you give, I mean, this is a little technical linguistics, head plus modifier, but it's if you have a noun and an adjective, what these people give you is they always give you the noun first and the adjective second. Now, it comes after it. What's interesting is that, if, again, if you look at Arabic, Arabic is much more complicated. Arabic has this order for um, adjectives and, uh, for nouns and adjectives, but for numerals, Arabic actually has the opposite order. So in Arabic, you don't say months three, you say, just like I presume in Slovenian, three months, right? So in Slovenian, it's like Arabic, that you put the adjective afterwards normally. No, it comes before. Okay. So, so this is like Italian, actually. Um, and what's into the negative in this language always comes afterwards, but in Arabic, the negative comes before. So the, again, the language is not operating like Arabic. It's operating on its own. Okay, this is a little bit technical, and I'm going to try and um, go through it fairly quickly, but I'll try and get you to understand. So, because it's an interesting point, um, people who have looked at human languages have noticed that they have what we call duality of patterning. And I'll explain to you, because it's a little hard to grasp what that means. Um, and I think I have some examples. Yeah, if you read this here carefully on the screen, just have, take a minute to read it, and then I'll ex show you what it, I mean, I'll explain to you what it means. It's pretty easy. So, if you take these three English words, tack, cat, and act, it's that they're composed of meaningless sounds. And the sounds together make up words. Does everybody see that? It's like letters making up words. And it turns out that all spoken languages work this way. There are no spoken languages that have like whole words that are somehow not, not made up of parts. So it's not as if, I mean, you could imagine a caveman language in which you know, a caveman would have the word uh, and another word rah, and another word uh, rah, and each one of those words would be a complete whole and they wouldn't be made up of individual sounds which are, you know, basically, well, in, that work like letters, right? So every spoken language works basically is, is the spoken is, is a sort of analogous to, to an alphabetical system. So that's what we call duality of patterning. And as I said, every single spoken language that anybody has ever heard of works that way. What is remarkable is that this is also true, I'll skip through that slide, this is also true of sign languages. So the way sign languages work is that just like spoken languages, the gestures, we think that the gestures are somehow, you know, complete gestures. But that's not true. If you look at, it, at any well-established sign language, every sign that somebody uses actually is made up 
from these discrete parts. So any sign language, American sign language or Italian sign language, what do they, do you know what people use here in Slovenia? <laughs> okay. But most French sign language, whatever, this, the individual signs are made up of discrete parts. Um, and that, in fact, was the first, per when the first linguist who studied sign language, that was the first thing that he noticed, was that the language wasn't just uh, undecomposable gestures, but that the gestures themselves were made out of basically um, discrete hand configurations, right? So every, every sign has one hand configuration, one location, and one movement, right? That's every single sign. Uh, and I'll show you how that works in two different sign languages by using what we call minimal pairs. So here is Israeli sign language, and in Israeli sign language, the sign for say and the sign for ask are the same, except one uses this, that goes like this, that's ask, right? And the other one uses this and goes like that. So they're identical except for the configuration of the fingers. We call those, we call those minimal pairs. So that shows us that those two hand configurations can be used to distinguish two different signs. Here's another example uh, from American Sign Language of sick, which is, sorry, it's um, this, this hand shape. This is sick, right, and this is touch. So the hand has exactly the same shape, but it's in two different places. All right. Um, here's one, a very nice one with hand orientation. So this is compare in Israeli sign language, and this is vacillate, meaning to, you know, not be able to decide. So it's the same hand, except in one case it's this way, and the other case it's that way. So those are what we call minimal pairs. If you look at this sign language, it turns out that it has not yet reached that stage. So it has individual signs, but the signs within the signs, they do not have an established structure. So people cannot tell within the individual signs what, um, what exactly is uh, uh, the structure. There is no fixed structure. And I'll actually show you some examples of that. So what you're going to see now is different people making the sign banana. And what it looks like, you'll, you'll, it's what you expect, of course, which is people peeling a banana. But what you'll see is that there's no fixed shape of the hands, that different people will hold their hands in different ways. So the sign is not yet conventionalized. It hasn't become fully conventionalized. And they haven't developed these contrastive hand shapes. Look at the different hand. You watch their hand. Completely different. And she's got. This guy's lazy. Look at him. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Okay, I'll give you another sign, sign for dog. Some have two, two hands, some have one hand, some are down here, some are up here. <laughs> See, it's just kind of, <laughs> all right, so everybody gets the point? All right. Um, one of the things that's interesting, though, is even though they don't seem to have the same fine structure as in other sign languages, just as you expect, uh, just as happens with, nor with, with, with fully developed languages, these languages are already developing dialects. So we already have Serbian and Croatian. In this case, however, there, it's, it's different families. So what happens is that the signs that are used in different households are actually sometimes different. 
And I'll give you some examples of that. So these are people from two different families. You see his sign for kettle is actually something like, this is a sign for cup, and this is a sign for pour, right? So cup, pour, right? His sign for kettle is drink, so not cup, but drink, and this is boil, right? So they come from two different families. They have two different signs for the same thing. Um, by the way, you can see that they have compound words. It's kind of interesting. They have, in fact, they have a lot of compound words. So one of the things we're working on, actually, is what the order of the elements is in the compound words in the language. But you see here, these are three brothers. Uh, two of them are deaf and one is not. I can't remember. I think this guy isn't deaf. They're very close together. And you can see that they have exactly the same sign. So they are members of the same family, right? So they have the cup pour sign. There's cup pour, cup pour, right? And what's different about this guy? He's left-handed. But I, the, the, signers, by the way, they don't care. I mean, they, they don't have any problem interpreting left and right-handed people. Um, I'll show you another family. Again, this one we have video. These are two sisters and a daughter. And that's their word for kettle. So, yeah, that's the youngest daughter that we saw before. That's Nura. So again, even though it's a very, very young language, already they're developing dialects. We call them family lects. Um, of different ways of saying um, individual words. So what it looks like to us is that this language doesn't need the kind of dual patterning that other languages do. And I won't bother to go into the details, but you can actually demonstrate mathematically that if you don't, unless you have a certain number of words, you don't need to move to this kind of second level of patterning. And there's pe people who have done some interesting work on that. OK, I mentioned compounding. So we saw the word kettle, and that the language has these compounds. One of the things that's been observed is that compounding is found in very young spoken languages. So I don't know if people here are familiar with pidgin and creole languages. They're what we call contact languages. So when you get people who speak uh, different languages and they have to work with one another, they develop these pidgin languages which then become creole languages. And those are also young languages and they have interesting features. Um, of course, they don't come from nothing, they come from other languages, but um, they have certain patterns that are similar to this particular language. Um, I'm not going to go into this whole business about verb agreement, which is a very, very complicated matter. It's quite fascinating, but I'll just mention it to you. It turns out that sign languages, even fairly new sign languages, have very elaborate patterns of verb agreement, basically having to do with verbs of giving and, t uh, and, and taking and things like that. So what signers do is they set up a space and they locate people in those spaces. And then for, they, they'll do like this to say, you know, one person gives to another, one person takes from another, that sort of thing. That doesn't happen or has not happened in this language. Instead, the, what the signers do, and I, I'll show you a, a very brief example of that later, is everything goes this way. So no matter who they're talking about, it just goes this way from the signer. All right, let me briefly mention compounds to you, and one of the things that's interesting is that though the language is very young, they have different kinds of compounds. So these are compounds for place names. And what they do is they'll, uh, so their, their name for Lebanon is long beard there, and I'm not sure. What they do is they pick out some peculiar characteristic which doesn't, to me at least, doesn't have anything to do with the place, because as far as I know, there aren't people with long beards in Lebanon. But that's what they've decided. So Lebanon is long beard there. 
Hebron, which is a town about 20 kilometers away, is headscarf there because they, you know, and Jordan, which is not very far, is head medallion there. So they use this there, which is this kind of a gesture like that. It's hard to describe. I, I, if I had videos, I would show you. And that's sort of their, their word for place. So they've already developed this word for place, but they use it in this kind of compound structure. The point of all of this is that even though the language is very young, the people are already developing these fairly elaborate patterns um, on their own. It's, sometimes I think of this as um, what is, is, is it, it just comes from the, the human ability to play. That humans like to play and they like to construct these fairly elaborate systems. And that, I think, is what's going on in this particular case. Uh, it's another kind of compound where uh, it's not a place, but they just put two words together to give you a place. Okay, let me very, very briefly this, mention this agreement morphology. Um, basically, just to tell you that they don't have any in this language. And in order to show you that they don't have any, I'm going to show you a video. And what the video is going to demonstrate is when you'll watch, you'll watch what they see, and that is you'll see a man, ha uh, I'm sorry, a woman gives a shirt to a man. So there's a woman standing here, and there's a man standing there, and she's going to give him the shirt. What the signers do is they don't, they'll, they'll actually point to a woman here and a man there, but then the giving, they go like this, straight out from the body. Now why it's straight out from the body would take a long time to explain, but they don't go across like that, which you do in most sign languages. Man, that's man, there, woman. So what she's saying is, man standing, woman shirt give, man take. <laughs> I'll play them again. So in a, in a developed sign language, you would actually see, they would place them in, in a kind of a scene, but in this sign language, they don't bother to do that. There's some other things going on very interesting in the syntax. This is the word for woman, and it's because um, 50 years ago, women used to have tattoos. Married women had tattoos here. They don't have tattoos there anymore, but when the word was made up, women had tat married women had tattoos, so they used this sign. Men, you know, this is your picture of an old Bedouin man and wearing a keffiyeh, and with a big mustache, uh, and that's why they have that for man. So I'll play that one again, so you see. Man, there, woman, shirt, man, take. It's the same thing, just speed it up. We're showing you slow because it's easier to see. Okay. I'm going to show you the same thing again, but this will be somebody else. A little girl, Nora. She does it much faster. But again, she does it out. She doesn't. Okay. So one question that you could ask is, well, what can this language tell us about the beginning of language? One answer is that, as I said, you see a lot of mimetic imitation in the language. So it shows you that language, a language doesn't have to emerge all by, you know, immediately as sort of a, a, a discrete system. What you get is kind of a mixture, in, at least in the older signers, between this, this sort of Marcel Marceau, as I said, and individual words. The language has very, very strict phrase patterning, um, but it manages to do that without 
having really, uh, the, the, without the signs being as, as highly structured as they are, as we expect them to be. Um, now, this is kind of fancy technical term, but the question is, well, how do these people figure out how the language works and how, what the structure is? What is the phrasal structure of the language? Now, when we speak a language, it turns out that children learn the phrasal structure. They learn to figure out what the phrase structure is, in large part from what we call prosodic structure, which is how we phrase our speech, how we pause. Right? and the sorts, what happens to the intonation of our voice. So the question is, well, how are these people doing it? And the answer is, if you do very, very careful analysis, and you may have noticed it a little bit, and you'll sh I'll show you in a bit, I'll show you another video, they are phrasing just like we are phrasing, but they are phrasing with their bodies and their eyes and their heads, so they'll do this sort of thing. They blink at certain spots, and that's how they're, fra they're chunking the words together in phrases. You have to use, there's a type of analysis that the CIA uses. Um, it's for, uh, for analyzing facial expressions. We use the same analysis, and we catch as many terrorists as they do. Um, and if you do that very, very careful analysis, you can see how people are using their facial expressions and their body posture to, to make sentences, to make phrases. So that's what these people are doing. Okay, uh, these are some of the children of the village. Thank, we thank them. We thank Shai Davidi, who is our videographer, who follows us everywhere. Uh, we thank the National Institutes of Health of the United States. We also have some grant money from, from the Israeli government. And um, I'm going to end, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you another video, which is quite long. This is a woman you've seen before. She is, as I said, the 10th signer to be born in the village. So she was one of the earliest people to use this language. She is going to tell you uh, basically the story of her early childhood, childhood and her early marriage. And it's actually quite a uh, wrenching story. It's um, really um, very, very, very touching and sad. Uh, and what is remarkable is that she manages to convey this, as I said, with a language that when she learned the language, she was the language itself was, you know, maybe 20-some years old, not much older than that, and she was, as I said, the 10th person to learn the language. So I'm going to run this video in the background, um, and I'll take some questions. She's a wonderful cook. <laughs> um, so, question time. Those first. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess um, if anybody has questions, I can ask otherwise, but please. Uh, Shun, can you take a second for Mike? Super interesting. And thank you all again for coming, really. Uh, thank you. Have any of the deaf um, sign language users acquired any knowledge of the spoken language through reading or any lip reading? Okay, um, they, they don't, they're completely illiterate and unlike many sign languages they don't seem to use mouthing so they don't, um, they don't sort of use their mouths to sort of form the the, the, the sort of anything similar to the Arabic word. They don't seem to do any lip reading. They really, um, it, it really, there's, I, I think there's another indication that there's really no connection between the language that they are signing and the spoken language of the community. They don't need it. Because, the, and I think the reason is because the hearing people communicate with them in the sign language, so they don't need to know the spoken language. They just use the sign language. Uh, these people in the village, uh, they seem uh, to cooperate with you very happily. Were they? 
uh, interested? Uh, yes. Um, it took us about two years to get into the village because it's a very isolated village. They're very interesting people because um, they're not really Bedouins. They are Egyptian. They were Egyptian farmers who came to work for the Bedouins about 200 years ago. So the Bedouins don't think that they're Bedouins, but everybody else does. And so they're kind of very isolated socially. And when we first went there, they were very suspicious of us. And also their village was not an officially recognized village. The government had been trying to chase them out of their village for 50 years, but they wouldn't move. Uh, and so they were worried, you know, maybe we had some connection to the government. But after about two years, we convinced them that we were just, we just wanted to know what their language was. And we also have been giving them a little bit of help in getting, they have a school in the village, but they don't have classes for the deaf children in their village school. So we've been trying to help them to get classes for the deaf children in the village so that they don't have to go to the big town to go to school. And by now, we are, we are very welcome there. And in fact, uh, sometimes too welcome. So we had a, pro what, a couple of years ago, one of the women, use that video that we showed you at the beginning? So the woman, on the, on, on the older one, not much older, but the old, one I said was older, she, had, she was married and she had a fight with her husband. And she left her husband and went to live in her father's house. Her husband was hearing. They never marry, deaf people marry hearing people. They never marry two deaf people. And one of us, one of the researchers, one day, after she had left the husband, about a week later, she gets a phone call from the husband. And he says, what, can you help me to get my wife back? And we thought about this for about three seconds, and we said, no, there's really nothing we can do. We can't help you to get your wife back. Um, unfortunately, the man died for, uh, I mean, he was much older than her. The man died, so we never really had to help him to get his wife back. But um, it's just an indication. And um, we are so welcome in the village, in fact, so, they feed us a lot of food. They like to feed us a lot of food. And the food is excellent. But sometimes we feel bad because they're poor people. And so we say, well, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't eat in, you know, all of our meals in the village. And they won't take any money. We tried to pay them. They won't even take money as normally we have money to pay people for working with us. And many of the women, especially as they, who know us well, they won't take any money. And um, so one day, this past summer, we said, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to eat lunch and then we'll go there after lunch. So we ate lunch and then we showed up about 2 o'clock in this woman's house and she said, well, you're going to stay for lunch. And we said, no, no, we just ate. We just ate in town. And she looked at us and her sister, who is hearing, came up to us and said, you're going to eat lunch. <laughs> so we stayed and it was wonderful food but so the, by now we really we're a part of the village though we don't stay there we don't usually stay there overnight um, though Carol Padden who is our the deaf linguist she's actually planning to go with her I guess 16 year old daughter and spend a week in one of the houses because she's particularly close with somebody now but we usually just go there during the daytime, we videotape, and then we go home in the evening. You mentioned uh, that you brought in schools that teach the deaf children, but they're probably teaching them in Israeli sign language. Right, right. So is this language facing extinction already? Yes. <laughs> so it's an interesting problem because what happens is the children go to school now, and when they go to school, they learn Israeli sign language, which is different from their sign language. What has happened is that most of the children are actually somewhat bilingual. And so you can say to them, you can say to them, I want you to use the village sign language, not, not Israeli sign language, and they can do that. Or the hearing children whose, whose brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. so if you have hearing children 
whose brothers and sisters are deaf, those hearing children will only know the village sign language. And so they actually, ironically, the younger hearing people may be better uh, subjects uh, than, the, uh, than, the, uh, than some of the younger deaf people. I don't know what will happen to the language. Mo there are many cases recorded of languages like this. The most famous was in an island in the United States called Martha's Vineyard. Martha's Vineyard is now where you know, the Kennedys and the Clintons and other rich people spend their summers. Um, and I think even uh, Sarkozy goes there. <laughs> but um, it used to be a very isolated, it's an island off the coast of Massachusetts, it used to be very isolated. And they had a very similar uh, situation to this, that they developed a recessive deafness. And during the 19th century, they actually had a sign language there. Uh, and there was a long book written about it about 10 years ago which said everyone here spoke sign language. It was very, very similar to this village, but what happened was that um, at the beginning of the 20th century, when they developed better communications with the mainland, the children went to school, to deaf schools, and also the, the, the island developed better sort of interaction with the rest of the world, and the language just died. So uh, we don't know how long this language will be around, um, we, uh, I'm hoping to hear either later tonight or tomorrow whether we got another grant to do more work. <laughs> so um, we have one more year on this grant, and if we get another grant, that'll be another five years. So we will at least be working 10 years in the village. Uh, we hope longer. But the other thing about language is that um, once you learn a language, you don't change it. So, pe and that's true for most people, you don't change it very much. So you learn your, your spoken language, you learn Slovenian pretty much by the age of 10, and then your language doesn't change. Of course, younger people, they learn the language and they learn it differently, but your own language stays pretty much the same. And so anybody who is alive now in the community who knows this sign language, we will be able to study, but what we won't be able to do is to see, well, we may not be able, we don't know, to see how it changes, um, you know, as, 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 as younger people come, are born into the community. Um, we'll see, the community in the five years that we've been working there, it has changed very much uh, in terms of um, their uh, uh, standard of living. When we first went there, People were living in really mud huts with no electricity, no running water, there was no roads in the village. But then the government officially recognized the village and that meant that they immediately got, uh, they began to put in water and electricity um, and there, maybe they'll put in streets. There's about 3,000 people who live there. So uh, the village and people are now building uh, mansions there. Uh, because some of the people, they go to work and they make a lot of money and they, there was one man who won the lottery. <laughs> and so in the middle of the village he built this big compound, a beautiful house, in the, because he won the lottery, you know. Um, so the village is becoming more prosperous and, you know, it will change. But. What about their signs for numbers? Do they use spe a special coding for big numbers? Do they use No, the numbers, um, we've tried to figure that out. They go up to about, um, to about 100. Um, but that's an area that we haven't really looked at very, very carefully. Um, but they use, you know, what you would expect. The, the actual signs are pretty much the sort of borrowed from Arabic, the number signs. It's a decimal system. It's, yeah, it's a decimal system. I have a lot of voice. But, uh, I was actually wondering exactly about such things like quantifiers, other types of function words. Is there any type of sort of idea of they use something like preposition? None. No function words. What we're doing, what we just started to do, so if you're interested, is to look at, to, to look for recursion. So it's a technical term, but basically, 
when people put one sentence inside another sentence. You know, uh, so if I say, um, um, uh, Mary said that John owned a Mercedes. So that's two sentences, one inside the other, right? Or the man who owned the Mercedes uh, drove it off the bridge. So again, two sentences within another. And we're trying to kind of, we give them certain types of tasks that kind of force them to do this, to see if they can do it with their language. And we think we're getting there, but it's very tricky. So that's a whole other, other area. But no function words. So on one side you said there is no agreement, and on the other side you said the words aren't really, how to say, subdivided. But right. Could these two things be related? And typically, you know, when you say Maybe. agreement is yeah, well, you it's were the way referring you, to yeah, it. It's, yeah, could be. And it's, yeah. it's, it's a little tricky. We have a long story about the beginning of agreement, but that's, again, if you had been in Vienna yesterday, you would have heard that lecture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another question on, on phonology of the language. You said that there are, like, no distinctive hand shapes. Right. But, I mean, from watching the videos, uh, it seems that they do have some things that have to do with the microphone, like they use only one hand or two hands right. simultaneously or alternately, alternately. So there are some signs of right, yeah, that, that right. Maybe. But it's not so. We're trying now to figure out to look at sort of more fine-grained analysis to figure out exactly what's going on with the hand shape. Um, we're doing that right now, like next week, but. So talk to me in 10 days, and maybe I'll be able to tell you something. You also said that the language changed rapidly from second to third, or is still changing. You don't know how right. much it changed from first to second right. generation, but it's changing from second to third. Right. But then again, third is the generation that went to Israeli uh, uh, sign language schools. Right, but they're not, what they're doing is not like Israeli sign language, so, but yeah, we worry all the time, and, but we can't prevent the children from going to school, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's why some of those very young children are fascinating, you know, the three and four-year-old children, because they, they don't go to school, mm -hmm. so. Another question related to the change, right? I mean, it's changing very quickly, this language, and you would not expect the spoken language to change so quickly. So, you know, is that, the way this language has evolved really show how our language has evolved? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. Really, it was a pleasure to have you as an audience. And uh, maybe I'll come back in a couple of years and show you some new things. Thank you.